start open to our meeting when I was study it is uh, January the 12th and we're going to be in first Kings 19. Um, we are back to normal schedule on Sunday Sunday schools at nine with uh, Larry Milliken doing a great job there of course at eight morning service at 10 Awana at five and uh, evening Bible study at 6 30. Uh, ladies Bible studies moved to Fridays at 9 a.m so if you're interested in Joining the ladies and Friday works for you. Liz, Liz will lead that Bible study on the apostles on Fridays at nine o'clock. And we do want to uh, just continue to invite you to those things this Saturday morning at eight o'clock for the men. If you're interested, Planata Community Church is having a um, men's prayer breakfast. It's a, more like a worship breakfast. There's a little devotion and some singing and uh, biscuits and gravy. It's really great. So uh Pastor Rick does that once a month, and so we encourage you to, to join us if you'd like to. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time and just ask you to bless our study today and uh, just continue to uh, protect your work and guide us in Jesus' name. Uh, so 1 Kings chapter 19, at the end of chapter 18, um, Elijah has challenged uh, the prophets of Baal to this amazing display of power of God. He challenges the 450 or more prophets of Baal to get a bullock, put it on an altar, cry out to their God for fire. And of course, Baal's gods can't do it because Baal's gods aren't, they don't exist. So that then in turn, he put the bullock for God put water all over it and called out for heaven and God miraculously uh, burnt the stones and the dust and everything and uh, gave proof. And, and the people fell on their faces, believing that the God of Israel was the true God. And it was a pretty incredible moment. Um, Elijah was bold. Elijah was accurate. Elijah was man of faith and courage and um god did a great work and so chapter 19 is the immediate follow-up to that so ahab told jezebel all that elijah had done how he had executed all the prophets with the sword then jezebel sent messengers to elijah saying so let the gods do to me and more also if i do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So the message got back to Jezebel and Jezebel sends a message to Elijah that may the gods kill me if I don't make you like one of these prophets you killed. Basically, she threatens his life. Well, obviously, Elijah is not going to be bothered by this. He just had this amazing victory over all of these prophets of Baal, he's certainly not going to be afraid of a queen calling out her false gods. And yet, the Bible says in verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So he leaves. He goes to the southernmost part of Judah and um, he runs away. Um, this is an interesting response by Elijah, only because it, 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 some of it makes no sense. Um, Jezebel is frustrated that, that, you know, her prophets are gone. And now Elijah probably thought that, that after this, everybody would run to God. Everybody would follow him. That he'd have no more issues, no more problems. That this would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was right about his God. And it could be a, a place that we feel, you know, that, that what is it going to take for our children, our neighbors, our loved ones, our, our relatives to believe in Jesus Christ, to know that the Bible is true. Uh, when you know it's true, when you have a firm foundation and a faith that, that is unwavering, that you look at this, this, 
knowledge of God and this this belief in the Bible that that Liz and I have, it's not something that is is forced upon us. It's not a brainwashing. Um, it is a logical, uh, clear uh, evidence that the Bible is true and that God is real and that Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross and that he is the way, the truth, and life. And he's the only way to salvation. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. So we're positive. But sharing that truth with others is, is, is hard because it's just not accepted. And so I, I relate a little bit to this frustration that Elijah might have. He might have thought that this was the last time he was ever going to have to struggle with this. And yet here he goes, the very next day. And just like it is for some of us, we're, we have good days and bad days, strong days and weak days. Uh, days where we just so uh, empowered in the Holy Spirit, nothing's going to shake us. And other days where we're just uh, struggling. And so uh, he runs, he goes to Beersheba. And how God responds to him is very important in verse four. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die saying, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. This is tough. He wants to die, and he's not the only person in the Bible. There have been others. Now, it, it, it's not an option, especially someone under the Jewish law. It's really just the thought of suicide but we saw this you know with jonah you know job talked a little bit about this and others too where they get to the point where you know, job says be better if i wasn't ever born at all and so we get to this point where he is done he's had it he thought you know you get to that highest of high that great of great and there's no way it's ever going to be bad again and it still is and uh, the Bible speaks of this in, in Galatians 6, verse 7. It says this, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. For he who has sown to his flesh will reap corruption. He who has sows to the spirit of will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So God warns us this. Um, it says, therefore, verse 10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. But as you're doing good to those who are the household of faith or those who are around you, and Jesus went about doing good, uh, God says, don't get tired of doing good because it won't be appreciated as much as you want it to be. And uh, it, it may be hard work and, and it may not reap all of the visible blessings that, that you might think it's going to. And as a result, um, you can get tired of doing good. You know, the, the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Paul says the things I want to do, I don't do things I don't want to do, I do. And what happens is you become weary. It's easy to let the flesh go do whatever you want feed off of that. That's part of what is kind of a, a little bit of a danger in our culture today is the, the push to just do whatever your flesh feels like doing. That, that war between the flesh and the spirit, it, it, it takes effort. And uh, so some days we're just, we're weary. And God warns us in Galatians, be not weary in doing good. And, and because he says that, we know that it's a potential. And that's, I think, what we see here with Elijah. And he prays for God to take his life. Well, we thank God for unanswered prayers. We thank God. We know that Romans 8 says that we don't know how we ought to pray. 
but that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us and that the Holy Spirit knows what God's will is. So God doesn't answer every prayer we throw out there with a yes, because not everything we pray is good for us. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit intercedes on behalf of, of the will of God. And he does that here with Elijah. Um, and then verses 5 through 8, they're just beautiful. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. So as he lay and slept under the broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. This is beautiful. God doesn't rebuke him. God's not mad at him. God's not saying, Hey, don't you? You know, he doesn't say, You want to die? Fine. You die. He comforts him, he feeds him. It's a beautiful picture. He looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. God knew it. The journey is too great for us. We need God. Without God, we can't do anything. John 15, 5. Verse 8 says, He arose, ate, and drank, and went in strength. Of that for 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Oreb in the mountain of God. And that's Mount Sinai. And he's down there in the sacred place. And God feeds him, comforts him, and, and gave him strength for 40 days and 40 nights. Just as, as the wandering of the wilderness. And this is basically um, a wilderness uh, a journey for Elijah. And some of us have that. And once in a while, we got to get away. Uh, sometimes we call it a sabbatical, a Sabbath, or a time of rest, in which we just need to take a break. And we get a little overwhelmed. Uh, I've been there. Uh, and I know you probably have too. Uh, the beautiful thing is God is there to comfort us. He understands that this, this life can be hard. Ministry can be hard. Doing good can be hard. So God is there to comfort you. Um, it, it shouldn't be this way for Elijah. He just had the mountaintop amazing experience the day before. Um, and you wouldn't think he'd have a day like this so, so soon, uh, but he does. And uh, for a couple different reasons, we'll get to that in, in, a, in a minute. But I do want you to turn 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 really deals with this principle of comfort. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the times in your life where you really need God to bring you comfort. Uh, if Elijah needed it, you're going to need it. I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know what. But here's what God says about comfort in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are with, in trouble with the comfort in which we ourselves are comforted by God. This principle is, as we go through these down times and we are then lifted up by God and comforted by God, we can take that and go and comfort others also. And, and um, Liz, uh, one time we lost our son Samuel years ago. Uh, a couple of weeks before the due date. And um, Liz, as a result of being comforted through that, has uh, been able to, on more than one occasion, comfort young ladies who have gone through the same thing. And uh, they can't look at Liz and say, you don't know what I'm going through. Because as God brings you through something and comforts you through that, you then have the ability to turn and use that comfort to comfort others, to let people know you can get through this. God will be with you. Verse 5 says, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. And that consolation is that, that extreme comfort. So just as the other example, not only can you comfort others, but Christ's suffering uh, shows us that he's willing to suffer, and, and we see that. Verse 6 says, now, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort or consolation and salvation, which is effective 
for enduring the same suffering which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will be partakers of the consolation. So when we see the suffering of Christ and what he was willing to do, we then are willing to suffer for him, knowing that with the same comfort we, we got through salvation, that by the suffering of Christ came the salvation of our souls. Our suffering is going to bring glory to God in some way, some manner. Maybe not for us, but maybe for someone else. There's a reason and a purpose. Rejoice when you go through trials. Verse 8 says, We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength, so that we were despaired even our life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, though, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. But we were at the very point where we thought we were going to die. But we were comforted with the knowledge that God can raise the dead. Comforted with the knowledge that God had a purpose. And comforted in the knowledge that the sufferings of this world are not to be compared with the glories above. Verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us in whom we trust and he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given to the many persons but on behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So when we are joining each other and praying for those who are going through these trials, there's comfort in prayer. There's comfort in sharing these uh, experiences together. There's comfort in knowing that God has not asked us to do anything that he didn't do for us. And comfort in knowing that God has a reason and a plan. So this is all what Elijah was missing when he went through this trial. We have a God who is the God of all comfort. It's an amazing principle in Scripture. It's something that, that we can really take with us during this time. So in verse 9 and 10, back in 1 Kings, Elijah goes into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? So God strengthens him for 40 days and 40 nights, gives him a little respite, gives him a little Sabbath. And then finally, it's time for, for him to, to move on from this. And God asks him a question. God knows what he's doing. There. But he asks the question to Elijah so Elijah can come face to face with what he's really going through. And now we get Elijah's real um, heart. He says in verse 10, I've been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, for the children of Israel, and forsaken, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Well, this is, I want to really talk to you about this a little bit. So when we get down to the nitty-gritty of why he ran. He was weary and well-doing. He says, look, I've been very zealous for you, but these children, they forsake you. They turn from you. They've killed all your prophets. I'm the only prophet left, and now they want to kill me. And he has lost a little bit of trust in God. And Spurgeon said this, which I thought was very, very, very interesting. Um, he said, that Elijah's desire to die is a result of him feeling as if he's the last lone one left all by himself. And everyone's against him. But Spurgeon makes the point that that should be a motivation to stay alive. Because if he's the last one left, he ought to be motivated to keep preaching. And he wants to die because they want to kill him. Well, in the right mind, he would be where he was the day before, standing boldly, mocking the people. But he's having a bad day. 
and he's not strengthened and he's not strong and he can't take it anymore. And he wants to die. But logically, if you're the last one left, you ought to be standing. And if you want to die because they're trying to kill you, that doesn't make logical sense either. Um, so verse 11, here's what God tells him. Go out, stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, there passed by a great and strong wind that tore through the mountain and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So God illustrates something. Remember what Elijah's issue was. I am alone. This amazing thing just happened. They still want to kill me. They've killed all the other prophets. And God gives them three illustrations. Wind, earthquake, and fire. And God is not in any one of them. God was in the still, small voice. And there's some great lessons to learn from this. The Bible says in Zechariah 4, 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord. So God says, you know, you're, you're going to see me in the spirit. But we want to look for the might and the power. We want signs and wonders and bells and whistles. And Elijah is seeing no evidence of God. He thinks he's the last one left. We're going to see in a, in a few couple of verses, he's not the last one left. And God is reminding him, you know, you're, you think I'm not working. And this is the important part of this. You're looking, for example, in our nation, we're waiting for God to do something. Shake up this nation. Is it going to be judgmental? Is the Lord going to return? Is he going to, and we're looking for this major end time event to happen to fix everything. And God says, oh, I'm in the small, quiet places. And I am working in your life, the life of this nation, the life of your families. And we have certain things we're praying for when it comes to our family, certain things we're praying for when it comes to our church, certain things I'm praying for when it comes to the school. And uh, you don't always really see God like do a mighty shaking and, and God is answering those prayers, but it can be in a still small voice that you don't recognize. That's where God is. And you're having a, a difficult time, uh, discouraged or you're hurting, don't go to Facebook, don't go to Twitter, don't go to, go to God quietly in your closet, and, and he, you'll hear him in that still quiet, turn everything off, get away from the world, and get along with God, and those things will answer. Sometimes we look for God in the earthquakes, in the fire, and uh, John MacArthur, I think it was, once said that that some churches, if they turned off their, their instruments and they turned off the fancy lights and they just had a man stand there reading the scriptures, how would their attendance be? And so sometimes when we go to church, we go to churches that have the wind and the fire and the earthquakes and all of the loudness. God's not really there. God is in the meeting. And the meeting is a word. The word was with God. The word was God. And so sometimes we don't see God because we look for the bells and the whistles. But God is in the environments. Just beautiful verses. Um, verse 12. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle went and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly there was a voice that came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 14, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left 
and they seek to take my life. So he's got the same complaint. And this is where God fixes it. The Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness and Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel, king of Syria. Then you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel mahola you shall appoint anoint as a prophet in your place it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of haziel jehu will kill whoever escapes the sword of jehu elisha will kill yet i have reserved seven thousand in israel all those whose knees have not bowed to baal and every mouth that has not kissed him and so the second time he shows him the wind and the fire and the rain and then it lets them know, look it, I'm not worried. Don't quit looking else outward. I'm here. I'm working. You don't see me working. It's this quiet voice. And he says to him again, I alone am left. And God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. And God gives him a task. It's time for him to stop kind of uh, the sabbatical's over. It's time for him to get back up and, and do some things for God. And God reminds him. I've been, I've got 7,000 others just like you. And you're not alone. And God is working. And God hasn't um, neglected you. And God hasn't left you. And God hasn't left this country. And God hasn't turned his back on the world. He's still working and he'll be working in it until the sun comes back. Now we may be under the wrath of God or the punishment of God, but God is still working. And when it looks like you're all alone, God says, look, I got 7,000. So here's what I want you to do. You're going to go get uh, Jehu, and he's going to be king. So I'm taking care of Ahab and Jezebel. They're going to be gone. Don't worry about them. All right? And I want you to go get Elisha, and Elisha's going to help you. I'm not going to leave you alone. You, you need somebody to be with you. And he's going to take your place. And here's what the Bible says. I love this verse. In Romans chapter 6, it says, therefore, verse 12 of Romans 6, give a chance to turn if you want to. It says, therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law, but under grace. This is talking about sin. And the idea is your members, which is your hand and your feet. It's like if somebody loses a hand, you say they're dismembered. So God says, take your members, your eyes and your lips and your hands, and present them as instruments of righteousness, not unrighteousness. The way to keep your body and flesh from sin is to, to put your body into places of service places of righteousness. If you do that, then you'll be less likely to be involved in activities of unrighteousness. Um, that's a beautiful thing. So he gets Elijah back working. And he changed, he's looking, I'm doing, doing everything he asks. I'm changing the kings. I've been planning to do that anyway. I've got a person to, to follow up and I got 7,000 more that haven't laid down. I'm working. You just don't see it because you're looking in the wrong places. God is working. What an encouragement to us. So verse 19, he departs from there and finds Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing and with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he was in the, the, the 12th. And Elijah passed by and threw his mantle on him. Now, the mantle is an interesting thing. We, we we're told in Zechariah 13, 4, that um, it shall be in the day. And this is the day where prophets are going, false prophets are going to be embarrassed in, in Zechariah. He explains it this way. In that day, every prophet should be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies, and they will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. So it was a common practice for a prophet to wear a little bit of a coarse kind of hair mantle. And it was a humble thing and a way of setting yourself apart to let the people know you were a prophet. It was like wearing a robe or a collar or something like that a religious person might wear. 
And in Zechariah, the, the false prophets were no longer pretending to dress like prophets. So we see that as this mantle. And when he places the mantle and places it on Elijah, he is signifying by this that God has called him to be a prophet. And given this, this message from God, he places that mantle on Elijah. In verse 20, he left the oxen, ran after Elijah and said, please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he again said to him, go back again for what have I, what have I done? To you? In other words, this mantle's from God. You're not following me. What have I done? I haven't done anything. I'm just doing what God told me to do. That's between you and God, basically what he's saying. And Elijah turned back from him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them, boiled the flesh of the oxen, using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people. And they ate, and he arose and followed Elijah. So he takes all of his things, all the things he's working on, he's done with them. His life is going to change. He has a, kind of a feast with the people to say goodbye, and he follows Elijah and became his servant. Now, that servant is the same Hebrew word used for Joshua when Joshua was called the assistant of Moses. So that's pretty interesting. That Elijah, or Elisha is to Elijah what Joshua was to Moses, and both Elisha and um, Joshua became great men. Um, so that's the chapter 19. It is um, a chapter in which we see discouragement. And, and through that discouragement, we see God comforting. We also see God convicting, showing Elijah that his discouragement is born out of false information about God and how he works and about what is really true in the world. He wasn't alone. God isn't done working. And Jezebel and Ahab aren't victorious. They're about to lose their kingdom. And God told him, look at, I'm not done. I'm still working. You're just looking for me in the wrong places. What's interesting in Romans 11, um, God uses Elijah in verse one through three, he talks in verse one of Romans 11. Um, the question is asked, has God cast away his people? You know, Romans is the transition to the Gentiles and ears and eyes of the Israelites have been blinded and, and deafened. And the question is, is, is he done with Israel? And he uses in, in verse two, he says, God has not cast away his people of Romans 11. He foreknew or do you not know what scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they've killed your prophets and I alone am left in verse four. But what does the divine response to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men. Verse five, even so at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. So when the question came, is God done with Israel? The response is to use this chapter as an example. That it may seem to us like God has done with Israel. But he would respond to us the same way he responded to Elijah. No, you can't see it. It's still small voice. But by the election of the remnant, according to the election of grace, I'm not done with Israel. And we can read Revelation and see the 144,000 witnesses from all tribes. And we can know that God has a plan in the future for Israel. But right now, it's the time of the Gentiles, but God uses Elijah. And, and so we can use Elijah to remind us that just because you can't see God working because there's not a bunch of, you know, wind and earthquakes, and fire raining from heaven. That's what everybody calls down for. And God says, man, get your attention off of that. This is where God is working. And I it still places and to this Discouraged. God will comfort you, strengthen you. You're not alone, and God is working. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this encouragement of these scriptures today in Jesus' name. All right, God bless you. Have a great day. We'll talk to you soon.